Germany and China are strengthening ties, but the German Chancellor's high level and high stakes visit to Beijing will be a diplomatic and economic challenge. Both countries can't seem to get a grip on their economic woes. China is trying to export masses of subsidized goods to Europe and America, but that creates new problems. The US and its Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen are already threatening further tariffs and a trade war. Meanwhile, Germany is trying a new China strategy, which oscillates between cooperation and isolation. On To The Point, we ask US-China trade war. Which side is Germany on? Welcome to this week's To The Point. I'm Javier Arguedas. It's good to have you with us. Let's meet this week's guests. Wendelin von Bredo is the senior Germany correspondent for The Economist based in Berlin. Felix Li is a journalist, a longtime correspondent in China and currently works for the specialist German news outlet China Table. And Matthew Karnitschnik is a journalist and correspondent with Politico here in Berlin. To all three of you, thank you very much for being with us. Wendelin, I'd like to start with you. China and Germany, two of the world's top economies, are both struggling right now. How did we get here? Well, they both have their problems um, related to demography. They ha that's the same. Um, slowing economic growth. Of course, China from a very high level and Germany from a slightly lower level. And Germany specifically had an energy price problem, which is sort of abated now. But... All this to explain that both are economically in dire straits. Now, Felix, China got the world used to very impressive growth figures and a rhetoric that seemed to suggest that it would become the world's number one power in the midterm. Was that all just an illusion then? No, it's not an illusion. I mean, China has become the second world biggest economy in the world. And, and uh, despite huge problems at the moment, uh, the property crisis, uh, uh, the housing uh, prices are dropping tremendously and people are not consuming much anymore. Um, despite all these problems, we shouldn't est underestimate uh, that technology-wise, China is still developing very, very fast and is aiming to be the top of the world in not all technologies, but in quite a number of technologies. We'll talk about what future perspectives are there for China. But first, Matthew, there used to be a huge rush in all the Western economies to engage with China, to sell to China, to do business with China. Why all of a sudden so much caution and fear, it seems? Well, I think initially the hope was that by engaging with China, by investing in China through big blue chip firms like General Electric in the United States, Siemens in Germany, or Volkswagen, uh, which went into China in a big way already in the 1980s, that that would liberalize China eventually and it would turn into a Western style democracy. That was basically the theory. And I think Already several years ago in the United States and uh, more recently in Europe, people have realized that that's not going to happen, that China is going to remain, for all intents and purposes, an authoritarian system. And because the United States feels threatened by what they see as China's attempts to um, Im improve its standing globally, improve its, its power base globally, um, you know, they need to counter that. So they're trying to withdraw a little bit, de-risk as the United States calls it, and they feel in particular at the moment threatened by what they see as China's attempts to possibly take over uh, Taiwan. You mentioned de-risking. That seems to be a, a concept Germany is following too, because for Germany, trade with China is a delicate balancing act. It needs China as a market for some of its main products, but at the same time wants to free itself from what is already a great dependency. A construction site with a promising future. The Swedish Northvolt Group is building a gigantic factory in northern Germany. Up to a million batteries for electric cars will soon be produced here annually. Investments like Northvolt's are strategically important for our country and for Europe. Germany was, is and remains a strong industrial nation. For this we need battery cells made in Germany, made in Europe. Europe. With projects like this, Germany hopes to not only drive innovation and create jobs, but to become more independent, especially from China. 
but the price will be high. Hundreds of millions of euros of tax revenue are pouring into this factory alone. E-cars, computer chips, space travel. Germany has failed to invest in new technologies. But to keep up with China, Germany needs to do even more. Upgrade its infrastructure, upskill workers, and streamline bureaucratic processes. How can Germany compete with China in the technology race? Felix, the most pessimistic voices say that China already has an irreversible advantage over Germany, for example, when it comes to critical technologies. Is it game over then for the Germans? Well, it's not game over yet, but it's very hard for the Germans now to compete with this, not only with China, but also especially with the US. And all these uh, very important future technologies, uh, AI, uh, uh, semiconductors, uh, Germany is lacking far behind, although uh, German uh, scientists uh, uh, used, to, uh, used to be very uh, advanced in all this, uh, the industry went to East Asia and to the US. And uh, this is very hard to uh, catch up now. And, and especially uh, with the rapid, and I'm not only talking there uh, on this on China, but also on a lot of other East Asian countries, um, you know, uh, how fast this is, uh, the technology is advancing there. Uh, I think it is very hard. And especially if you want to keep up, if the Germans want to keep up, they have to spend a lot of money on that. And yet, Wendelin, uh, research is still made in Germany uh, to a large extent. Uh, the, the patents are being registered in Germany to a large extent. What's going? What's what's missing? What's happening? I think it's really the the the, the state that's not supportive enough. Uh, we have in in America we have the RIA. China is pouring billions into promoting exactly this kind of technology, and we are clinging to our debt break. We being Germany, which is in this day and age when basically the future is decide the future of the might of the German economy. It, it's it's not the right thing, and and we the economists has, has argued now for a while that that. The, the debt breaks should be um, dropped from the constitution. So I think that's that's one problem. Problem number two is that uh, America and China are big powers, and Europe doesn't see itself yet really as a big power. It doesn't behave like that. And countries like Germany or France often don't work together enough, certainly with their economic or industrial policies, but rather against each other and promote their own small goals rather than the common European goals. So that those two problems, I think. It's certainly a, a matter of systems as well, Matthew. Uh, Germany is having a rough time with a coalition government that tries to find common ground between different parties. How difficult is it in the first place for a liberal democracy to implement changes or to make huge investments as opposed to a one-party system like the one in China, for example? Well, it's obviously easier in China than in a liberal democracy, but as the United States shows, it is possible to have a successful economy and be a, a democratic, um, maintain a democratic system. I think the problem in Germany and in Europe in general is that these problems go back much further than the current government. This has been going on for decades, really. If you look back at the trajectory, Germany's engagement in China, I was in China with the then CEO of Siemens in the early uh, 2000s, and he could see even then, he said what he was most worried about was that China was churning out uh, hundreds of thousands of engineers at the time, whereas in Germany, there were only uh, tens of, of, of thousands. And he said, you know, over time, this is going to be a huge disadvantage for us because they're going to catch up in terms of innovation, which is exactly what we're seeing now. I think there was a, a lot of, uh, you know, I think we could just call it arrogance in Europe for a long time, thinking that the Chinese were, they, they lacked the engineering capability and the sophistication to make the kinds of products that uh, Europeans were in terms of Airbus or in terms of the, the high-end cars and so forth. People didn't take it seriously, um, and now they're taking it seriously because it's because it's because it's happening. And I think that the the system here is the political system makes it, it, it maybe a little bit more difficult to pivot to pivot quickly. Certainly, you seem to put it like they woke up and saw the reality. Now China is there; it is a very important power. Um, Germany is now unveiling this so-called China strategy, which focuses on de-risking, as we just mentioned. Um, Wendelin, what do you make of that uh, concept and how difficult does it make it for German businesses to succeed? 
Well, so the, the German China strategy was uh, un, unveiled last year, so, so, but they've been working on it for much longer than they had intended. They, <coughs> they kept delaying the publication because it was so complex, because they had to basically toe a fine line between de-risking but not decoupling and, you know, how exactly do you define it? And that's very hard, but essentially there, it's, it's some big German companies that really depend on China and for, for whom the Chinese market is very, very important. The vast majority of small, medium-sized companies, you know, they don't have that much business in China. But these are very important and probably, you know, they, they can't fail. They determine Germany's China policies. But it's really BASF, four big car makers and maybe Siemens, and that's it. But, of course, they do weigh a lot. Um, meanwhile, Felix, when we took a look at what uh, voices we can hear in China, some of the uh, business people that work in China say that the German government is uh, overreacting, that it is not really capable of understanding, that it doesn't have sufficient knowledge of China's potential ambitions and goals. What do you make of that criticism? Well, it also depends on like, oh, like how you described it, who you're talking to. I mean, if you talk to these big five companies who are so involved in China and so dependent on the Chinese market. Um, of course, uh, they criticize the, uh, uh, the China strategy and that the German government is too, uh, too critical and too skeptical. If you talk to uh, smaller companies who are also engaged in China uh, for quite a long time, they feel that it's, uh, the market is getting much harder, that it's, uh, they're playing not on the same level uh, with Chinese competitors. Uh, the government is not, Chinese government is not treating them well. So they, you hear these complaints and I think they are very true. Could you explain a little bit more what exactly they feel is not the level playing? For example, when uh, a provincial government is saying, okay, uh, uh, we want to build, build uh, this uh, 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 road or, or uh, that uh, usually in a free market, all companies can are allowed to apply for it. But of course, in China, uh, they, uh, they prioritize their own uh, Chinese companies. And that's why the German companies are not playing on the same level. It used to be different. That's how they uh, came to China. And now, all of a sudden, the Chinese side shows them we don't need you anymore. And uh, this is hard for them, of course. Uh, the other problem is, uh, uh, and I think this is a big topic uh, also on Scholz's trip in China now, but not only because it um, uh, 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 concerns the whole world, is the overcapacities China, China's economy has created. And this is, uh, I mean, China itself is suffering from this, but this is uh, part of the system, of the Chinese system. In a China is not a free market uh, and has never been. Um, when the central government is saying, okay, we want to be uh, head in, for example, e e electronic cars, and then all provincial government, all local government uh, build up or create their own e-car companies. And now we have over 100 e-car companies and not even the central government is saying these are 100 too much. We, the whole market can only hold five of them. The problem is uh, that it's not only a question inside of China that there is overcapacities. Now um, the Chinese companies are flooding the world with their products. And that means uh, it's not only a question if from these 105 e-car companies in China, if all, uh, which of the Chinese companies are not surviving, but the, in the whole world. If Volkswagen is surviving this overcapacity pr problem which China has created. There's certainly an economic aspect to this China strategy, but of course also a political one, Matthew. One of the fears is that Germany could become politically susceptible to extortion, a lesson learned uh, from Russia and the dependency on oil and gas. Do you see parallels there? Yeah, there are absolutely parallels because you know, the, the German export economy is very dependent on China. And I would push back on the idea a little bit that it's that it's just these these big five. I think that there is a long tail behind them. They all have suppliers. There are a lot of little companies that supply Mercedes, BMW, etc. They've also set up shop in China. 
uh, China is now the biggest market for VW, for example, which is why there's, you know, as there are discussions as we speak here in Brussels within the EU about um, introducing tariffs on Chinese electric cars, you're hearing from the German car makers, well, you know, we don't, we don't support that, where you would think, well, naturally they would support it. Well, why don't they support it? Because they're afraid of retaliation in, in China, which is a, a, the key market for them. So I think that it is too late for Germany to do anything about it. And I think that is what hasn't really dawned on people here in Berlin. And I think that is also the story really behind this trip of, of you know, Schultz going there. This isn't his first trip recently. He was there also in 2022. In fact, he was the first major world leader to go and visit Xi Jinping after he was basically anointed uh, president for life then. So that had a, you know, a symbolism as well. And even then he took along some CEOs with him, uh, not the massive delegation that we saw uh, during the, the Merkel years, but she also went every year pretty much uh, to, to, to China with a big um, a business delegation. And Schultz again this weekend is going for, for three days, I believe, and he's taking a fairly sizable delegation with him despite all of these political fears, despite all of the tensions with the, between the United States and China, et cetera. So you can see that I think Germany doesn't have a choice but to engage with China. But it also doesn't have a choice but to engage with the U.S. And the rivalry between China and the U.S. is about far more than economic issues. It's about a status as the world's number one power, which is another reason the U.S. is taking a much more confrontational approach when it comes to its many trade issues with China. China's economy is weakening. Telltale signs include empty buildings instead of boom towns, a construction sector suffering from a real estate bubble, and top companies drowning in debt. People in China are also holding on to their money, sticking many manufacturers with leftover merchandise. A surplus of goods made in China is now flooding global markets at subsidized dumping prices, including electric cars and solar panels. This is threatening to further strain the already tense relationship between China and the U.S. And when the global market is flooded by artificially cheap Chinese products, the viability of American and other foreign firms is put into question. Subsidies, protective tariffs, import bans. Despite these contentious issues, the U.S. and China recently held talks to try to address the problems. Is fair trade with China even possible? Felix, you described uh, extensively why it is considered unfair. Uh, can it become fair? Do you see that? I don't see it with this system. I mean, as I mentioned, the overcapacity, it's a problem for the Chinese for the Chinese economy too. But it's caused by the system because in the usual free market economy with so many car companies, for example, uh, uh, they would, uh, they would go, bankrupt, yeah. go bankrupt. But this is not happening in China. So all these provincial uh, governments, they keep up and uh, holding up to these companies. And that's why we have these. And it's not only about e-cars, it's about we, we had this in the past with steel, we have, have that with solar panels, we have that with batteries, we will have that even with semiconductors. So um, but I think uh, Europe, the US is already reacting, Japan has reacted, South Korea reacted. I think there is no choice for the Euro Europeans also to react on this. I don't know which is uh, would, be, would be the right uh, uh, measurements, but um, it cannot do as it uh, just let, let it Business happen, as usual, because yeah. um, otherwise a lot of European companies will get bankrupt too because of these awful capacities from China. The U.S. seems to be leading the way when it comes to reacting to that, uh, Vendelin. However, the U.S. economy is doing far better than the Chinese economy. So why this obsession, it seems, to keep China at bay? It is uh, doing much better, but, uh, but of course there was already some uh, hot trade war in 2018 uh, when uh, uh, Donald Trump was president. And, uh, you know, there is the danger that uh, Trump will win again. And he already said he will, he will sharpen uh, tariffs again and he will sort of um, turn up the heat on China. I think it's a lot about who, as you said, who is the biggest power in the world. So it's not only the economy. The economy is doing much better in America, partly because of the RA, partly because lots of reasons. But, but, but it's more than that. It's, it's you know, who is the world's number one? And, 
and and that's related to the economy and to trade. And so I think there is a danger that, if anything, the trade war will be reignited come by, by the end of this year. And where does that leave Germany, Matthew, do you say? Um, does it have to make a choice between China and the U.S.? I think if it has to make a choice, it would choose the U.S. because it still depends on the U.S. Uh, for its security. But I don't think that it will have to make a choice, just as the United States isn't really making a choice. I mean, you know, the dirty little secret about all of this is that the United States has massive trade with China as well. And that's the problem with this with this phrase, uh, de-risking. It's, it's basically, it's meaningless. I mean, it's a slogan that you can project onto anything, but what does it really mean? It, you know, the, the, the Germans are saying, well, that they are willing to de-risk. But if you look over the past couple of years and their their recent economic studies out on this, it shows that the Germans haven't de-risked at all. They're, they remain just as engaged in all of the major sectors as they were before. There was a lot of talk about um, Huawei, the the Chinese um, network equipment supplier for for mobile uh, networks and so forth, uh, and the United States didn't want European countries, particularly German Germany, to install the gear from Huawei for 5G. Uh, Mobile, mobile phone networks. Uh, and, and the Germans looked at this for years and said, they came up with a law and they said, okay, well, you know, under certain circumstances, we don't do it. Well, what, what has happened? Germany's continuing to use Huawei gear. Deutsche Telekom has it yep. installed all over the place here in Berlin. So there, there's a lot of sort of shadow boxing here. They're saying, oh yes, we'll take this seriously, but because of the economic realities, and let's not forget that Germany is not doing very well economically at the moment. It is again, the weakest or one of the weakest major economy in Europe in, in, in any case at the moment. And this is a, a major problem for, for Olaf Scholz. And I think, again, one of the reasons why he is traveling to uh, China with this big delegation, because he's trying to look for some good news on the economic front. And because China has been a source of uh, economic growth for Germany for such a long time, they're trying to reignite that. But the realities have changed also in China. China's not booming like it used to. And yet, you know, Germany doesn't have very many other places to go. So I think Germany is going to remain in this kind of purgatory, if you will. Um, and the United States, I don't think, is going to, you know, uh, you know, maybe if Trump comes back, he will, he will, he will yeah, try to, very to important you know, yeah. make some kind of uh, ultimatum there. But the reality is, is that he can't because the United States is also quite intertwined with the German economy, with the European economy, and nobody wants to, you know, risk all of these all of these relationships. Felix, do you see the same for China that it will continue to play with everyone, if you will? Uh, we barely know exactly what the plan is. Sometimes you have the impression. Okay, on the other hand, yes, China uh, wants to keep up all these relations, ec economic relations, because, I mean, China is a very globalized economy. And on the other hand, uh, we were talking a few years ago, we started to talk about decoupling. China is decoupling quite a while already. And not on everything, but on specific technologies where they say we want to get independent um, from Western technologies. And this is already happening. We're still discussing about it in China. It is already happening. So we do have, in total, we do have some sort of a deglobalization. And this, of course, hurts the Chinese economy, but probably this hurts even more the German economy. Can I just jump in? Because, sure. uh, Matthew, you said uh, it's, it's not really happening. I agree with Germany, right? They haven't really de-risked. I think America has de-risked, partly because, you know, the, the Trump's um, tariffs were so strict and, you know, hit all these measures. So I think there is, there is a little bit of a rebalancing and, you know, countries like Mexico have filled the void. I mean, maybe not not enough and not as much as it as it's a real de-risking, but something has happened. I, I mean, in overall trade flows, I mean, mm. in certain sectors, obviously, the, you know, in, in, in a lot of what the United States considers to be sex, um, sensitive areas, you're, you're certainly seeing that. But in the overall trade flows, the, the trade relationship between the United States and China uh, remains essential for, for, for both countries, which I think it will be difficult for China and to... China's just financing the U.S. government. Exactly. Yeah. So China is doing what it has to do, the U.S. seems to be doing what it has to do, and the question is, and that's the closing question, where, where does this leave Germany? We all already said it's going to be in the middle. Do you see more of a risk or more of an opportunity in this confrontation between China and the US for Germany? Um, I think on balance there is more of a risk because it's uncertain. I think Germany would like to be a mediator, right? They, they, of course, the, the the most important relationship Germany has is with America for security reasons, for, hi, for historical reasons, and because both are democracies. But but because the Chinese economy is so important for Germany, Germany would 
like to be, the, you know, the honest broker in between. Can Germany play that role? I think that's the big question. What about you, Matthew? Risk or opportunity? I think it's a, ma a major risk um, because Germany is dependent on both of these markets and we're not really seeing the kind of uh, innovation that we were dis discussing earlier call, uh, co coming, out of, coming out of Germany uh, or, or Europe, quite frankly. So I think Germany is going to be in a very difficult position, especially uh, in, in the auto industry, which is, which is the core of the economy. You feel like yeah, last I but think, not least? Uh, uh, Germany has to do its homework. I think it's not enough blaming China and it's not enough blaming America for IRA. Germany has to invest more in future technologies and uh, 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 this has to happen. Otherwise, Germany will not play a major role in the world economy anymore. The outlook is not the best, but we'll see how it goes. Thank you, all three of you, for being with us. And of course, you for watching. Remember, you can always comment and watch our shows on YouTube. Just search for DW News. I'm Javier Arguedas. Until next time, take care and goodbye.